Hello racing fans, we're back again and we're going to share with you some more things that we do on race night that you may want to consider for your slot car club. This video is part two. If you haven't seen part one, I encourage you to watch that first. Link is in the description. When running club races, you're definitely going to need a way to track laps or count laps and also determine finishing positions. You could go with something as simple as this lap counter, maybe even use it in conjunction with a position tower. However, this setup is somewhat limited. We use race management software, which is loaded on a PC that's connected to the track, and this does several things for us. We input our schedule beforehand and have it set up to make pre-race announcements. Next race, drill bit. Cameras on. Wow! Tebow. <laughs> Jigsaw and Jimmy. Jigsaw. Who said that? Who said that? And in race and post race announcements. Race is over. Also, during the race, the drivers can look up at the screen and get info on their position, how many laps to go, stuff like that. It also automates the scoring, including advanced scoring if you like, where you can get bonus points for a lap led or most laps led. That sort of thing. Stuff you can't do with a simple plug-in lap counter. The software we're using is HSS RMS developed by Bruce Yingling. Information on that software is in the description. If you saw the previous video, you'll recognize this as an example of a schedule we might run. And what we try to do is keep the IDs for a driver the same throughout the entire night. If you look closely at this schedule, Salami is always on ID number one, Slater is always on number two, and the IDs for all the other racers stay the same for the most part. However, when you've got eight drivers and only six IDs, inevitably, someone's going to have to switch an ID for a race or two. And the reason we keep IDs with the drivers as much as possible is because when you switch an ID, you have to reprogram your car to a different controller. And that can cause confusion and delays. So when we know who's going to show up for a particular race night, ahead of time we'll go ahead and input the schedule and save those as heats. And if it happens to be all the same guys from a previous race night, there's nothing to do. All the heats have already been set up. So when we begin racing for the night, we load heat number one, run that race. When that one's over, we'll load the setup for heat number two, run that race, and so forth. Now this software does have an option to automatically rotate cars or drivers. We don't use this option because every time it rotates drivers, it also changes their ID. And as mentioned previous, that means we need to reprogram everybody's car in between each race. I think this is probably more suited towards analog racing where you'll have a six or eight lane track and you run on a different lane for each race. So that's why we prefer to just program a different setup for each heat and just load those as we go along. When all the heat races are over, we'll go ahead and open up the scoring tab. There we can see the points accumulated for all the drivers for the heat races. Based on that, we'll set up the B main, alternately called the last chance qualifier, and then after that, of course, the A main. If this race scheduling format is foreign to you, you'll want to watch the club considerations video part one. Just a note, this demonstration is using an older version of the software. If you were to go to the internet and download it now, it would most likely be the latest version. That version has a lot more options. However, all of the options we use and that were demonstrated here still exist in newer versions. We use ghost cars in our club. Actually, we run two of them simultaneously for each race. And that adds another element to the racing. Those cars aren't as fast, at least on the straightaways, as the regular drivers are. So they're kind of meant to get in the way, force people to change lanes. They can't run their preferred line the whole time. You have to be able to look ahead a little bit to see if you're going to be coming up on one of these slower ghost cars. And if you get stuck behind one, it can really slow you down. So a good driver won't only be faster than his opponents, but also be able to anticipate and negotiate traffic better as well. We have two of these we use as the ghost cars. These are the older NASCAR COTs that Carrera used to make. What's nice about these is they have the older G4 chassis with the adjustable magnet, so it's easier to tune this thing to get it to stick to the track. And that's important because the ghost cars only run one speed. They don't change speeds as they go around different parts of the track. 
So their top speed is going to be limited to how fast they can take the turns. So the speeds on the straightaway are going to be relatively slow compared to the live drivers who can accelerate when they hit a straightaway. Now we want them to be obstacles, something that you have to get around, however, they can't be ridiculously slow either. So it's funny, I tuned the tires really well for this demo so that I could show how much you have to make this car stick to turns. And I have to, <laughs> I have to laugh because this car is running so fast right now that I think half the guys in the club would actually lose to this ghost car in a race. Now you don't need an older G4 chassis car to use as a ghost car. You can get cars with the newer Gen 5 chassis to run just as well or even better. It's just that tire tuning is everything. You don't have the added benefit of a shimmable magnet. Ghost cars will change lanes at random. Probably half the time that they hit a lane changer, they'll change lanes. Sometimes they'll knock each other off the track. Also, as a live driver, they're impossible to predict. So if you're coming up next to a ghost car to pass it and you encounter a lane changer, Chances are about 50-50 that that some bitch is going to take you out. So in order to keep the ghost cars from being a wrecking crew, we'll cover the infrared emitter on the bottom of the car with electrical tape. That prevents them from changing lanes. So we'll start a ghost car in each lane and they'll stay in their respective lanes the entire race. A more advanced option is the anti-collision chips, but we're just sticking with cheap and simple. One more tip, not necessarily geared towards club racing, but if you want to do a quick tune-up on your tires and you don't want to tape your sandpaper down, it can be kind of awkward because you kind of need three hands. Instead, you can set your car to ghost mode at maximum speed, then you can have one hand to hold the car, one hand to hold the sandpaper, and you don't need a third hand to hold the controller. Also, if you're unfamiliar with the tire tuning technique shown here, you'll want to check out our video on tuning a slot car. Warning, don't forget to take it out of ghost mode because inevitably, this is going to happen. Crap! And look what happened. Destroyed the roadside memorial for, who is that? Yeah, little Susie. Yeah, it's probably how she got aced in the first place. People being careless. You definitely want to establish your rules, regulations, and penalties for violating said rules and regs beforehand for your slot car club as opposed to say kind of making them up as you go along. Here are some scenarios you may want to consider creating rules for. Running a ghost car off the track is illegal in our club and it should be illegal in everybody else's club too. Here's an example. For us, that's three stop and goes through the pits as a penalty. What about using the pit lane to pass? Do you allow that or not? And if not, and somebody does, what do you do? If you follow me. Consider you might end up with a reckless driver, someone running other cars off the turns, changing lanes into them, just basically a hack. Three strikes and they have to park it for the rest of that race possibly. In part one of this video series, we talked about the cars and our rules are that all the cars remain stock. So let's say you adopt those rules and somebody gets caught using a modified car. You know, what do you do there? Suspension, expulsion, take them out in the driveway and beat the crap out of them. That's what we do. But you can do whatever you want. So those were just some of the items you may want to consider creating a rule for and penalties as well. However, sometimes you can't think of everything. For example... In one of our races, somebody had to serve a stop and go, so they came into the pits behind somebody who was doing a regular fuel stop, and when they were done with their stop and go, they pushed that person out before their fueling was complete. And at the time, we didn't have a rule for that because it just never crossed our mind that somebody would pull off such a dick move like that, but they did. Needless to say, we do have a rule for that now, and a penalty. Unlike our recreation here where we used a single lane pit, that incident happened on a track where we had a double pit lane and the penalized driver had the option to take the open lane, but didn't. There's multiple ways to assess penalties. The previously mentioned stop and go penalty. However, if you only have a single lane pit, you may not want to have that as one of your penalties. Disqualification for like the rest of the race or you can dock laps at the end of the race as well. With race management software, you can assess in-race penalties also. Bottom line, be sure to establish your rules and regulations and penalties beforehand. 
The common sense ones are easy, but the hard part is trying to anticipate some of the things that people will try to get away with. In our club, before we start racing officially for the night, we'll go over the schedule, we'll go over the format, and also we'll go over the rules. Even though they've all heard them before, it never hurts to remind them again, that way nobody can claim that they didn't know. Each car has three changeable settings, the top speed, the braking, and the fuel. The top speed and the braking are driver preferences. They can set those to however they like to drive their car. More on that later though. But if you use a pit stop, be sure to set everybody's fuel to the same capacity. We pretty much always set the fuel to 50%. So for our track, at about 100 feet, each driver is going to have to stop twice for fuel in a 20 lap heat race. When we do this, everybody takes all their cars that they're going to run for that night, put them all on the track, and when we program it, it sets all the cars at the same time. Going back to the speed function on the control unit, this controls the maximum speed of the car, and I said before that it was the driver's preference. However, sometimes the driver's preference is not necessarily what's best for the driver. Let's say you have a smaller, tighter track where you're using all the sharper radius one or maybe even radius two turns and you've got short straightaways. It's a slower track. If everybody's top speed is set to 10, especially if the guys are newer at this, you're going to end up with a lot of crashes and a lot of marshalling. On a track like that, you can really only use half the speed of the car anyway. The other half will just get you into trouble. If that's the case, feel free to take everyone's top speed down to 8 or 7 or whatever works for that track. The car will be much more controllable, easier to drive, and also smoother because you can use all the throw of the plunger on the controller instead of just part of it. That's referred to as resolution. If you do this though, be sure to set everybody's car with the same top speed, otherwise you have controversy. And no one's going to really notice their car is slower, but they will notice that they're all of a sudden better drivers and their lap times are coming down. Because you know what? Sometimes slow is fast. And this tip isn't just for those new to the hobby. Slater and I have been running slot cars for I don't know how many years. Like decades. And we'll still adjust the top speed of the car to match the track because we know we're going to do better. We're going to run smoother than if we have a car that's got more speed than we can use. As a result, you're going to end up with cleaner racing, closer racing, basically more funner. One last thing that may apply to certain people, if you're thinking about starting a new slot car club in your home, having people come over, stay up late, make noise, reference this chart if you have a wife or a live-in girlfriend. This shows the probability of success of your slot car club based on your wife or girlfriend type. Essentially, the probability of success is directly proportional to how tolerant she is. Hopefully, this series has given you some ideas that you may want to integrate into your new or existing slot car club. That's it for us. Thanks for watching.